So, uh, like all fast-growing companies, we are uh, riding a wave. And this is a wave that's about demographics and technology, so let's just talk about demographics. Uh, three billion people are entering the middle class globally. Um, they are older, more urban, more affluent than ever, and they carry a massive burden of chronic disease. It's dementia, it's depression, it's diabetes, it's everywhere, and all of these people want access to health services. Now, a healthcare person in the room looking at this wave, you might start to panic, because the UK already spends a million pounds an hour treating type 2 diabetes. How could we possibly afford more? Global healthcare today is roughly 7 trillion. Can it be 20 trillion by 2025? Well, the answer is don't panic. Uh, every one of these 3 billion people that are entering the middle class will own a smartphone. They will all know how to use it. This is the most powerful digital platform ever conceived for healthcare. Don't let bureaucrats slow you down and talk about digital divide. Most of the content on Facebook is created by people over 70, not under the age of 17, and most people with a smartphone make less than $10 a day. So, I have an invitation, which is come and ride this wave with us. And we can stop the wave and talk about the future. So, in the 20th century, what we built was a sick care system, and it was designed to address the key challenges we had at that time, which were basically acute disease and trauma. And it was based on the very best technologies that we had in the 20th century. So it's buildings where you plug into electricity, because electricity was the great new utility of the 20th century. It's educated people with knowledge in their heads, because education was a great 20th century invention. And products that are tested in everybody to be safe and that work in somebody. In the 21st century, we are going to build a healthcare system. And it won't replace the sick care system, but it will complement it. And it will deal with the challenges that we have today, which are mainly chronic disease. Buildings where you plug into electricity are going to become mobile devices where you log on to the internet. And people with knowledge in their heads are going to become software and servers with intelligence in the cloud. And products that were designed to be safe in everybody and work in somebody are going to become services that are tailored to you, your genes, your lifestyle, and your behavior. That is what we call digital health. And the big question is how do you make that a reality. If you want people to shift from a paradigm that's about building people product, I go to a bookstore to see a clerk to buy a book, into a paradigm that's about mobile device, software, service, I go to an iPad, use software, download content, you need a hinge. You need an engagement trans transaction that is high frequency, high value, almost frictionless, that reflexively takes consumers from the physical to the digital space. Now, in e-commerce, that turned out to be buying a book. And in music and media, it turned out to be downloading a song. What is it going to be in healthcare? So, what we do is to focus on the thing that every person who is sick should do every day. It's called taking your medicine. And we make that a digital experience. So when you swallow your medicines, they turn on, and they talk to your phone, and they provide information about the drugs that you're swallowing and how your body responds to them. Your medicines take you to the digital space, and when you are there, we take you on a digital journey. It's just the beginning. So a song to Apple. You go to your iPhone, you download a, so download a song, and Apple takes you on a digital media journey. A book to Amazon. You go to your Kindle, you buy a book, and Amazon takes you on a digital e-commerce journey, a drug to Proteus. You go to your Samsung tablet, you check on your mum's heart failure, and we take you on a digital health journey. How do we do that? So the first thing is to say, look, people said 10 years ago when we started doing this that we were nuts, and they were absolutely right. Nuts is actually a key ingredient in what we deliver. We have an ingestible computing platform that's made from dietary minerals. Basically, this device is made of a couple of cashews, a mouthful of halibut, and an inch of banana. It is specifically designed to be embedded in any medicine at almost zero cost. It's completely safe. There's no battery, there's no radio, there's no antenna. When you swallow a digital medicine, it turns on, and it turns on because you turn it on. So if anybody here has made a potato battery, and some of you may have, then a bit of copper, a bit of magnesium in a potato, create a half-cell potential, you can light a diode. 
we have a few micrograms of copper, a few micrograms of magnesium. When you swallow the, one of these devices, you are a potato. Your body turns it on, creates power. We create a digital signal actually off the drug, uh, like a heartbeat, which we then use this Band-Aid you see here to decode. And so the drug is going to have a completely unique identifier. It's going to say, hello, I'm here, I'm Novartis, I'm Diavan, I'm 1.2 milligrams, I'm plant number 76, and I am pill number two. If you took five, we'd get all five. The Band-Aid is a sophisticated, FDA-cleared um, physiologic monitor. It measures your heart rate, your respiration, your body angle, your activity, your sleep, your temperature. Records all that data. It's paired with your phone. We use your mobile device as a sensing platform and a communications hub. We send it to the cloud. We send back information to you, your family, your doctor, people who you think can help you. All cleared by the FDA, approved by EMA, CE marked. Everybody very interested in creating new pathways to build new digital drugs. So we created a new digital NDA pathway that's a, a new way of bringing this kind of product to market. Why are people so interested? Huge leverage in terms of clinical outcomes and in regulatory science. I'll give you a case example. We're treating in the UK refractory hypertensive patients. These are people who are basically known to not respond to their medicines. They're refractory to therapy. They're at high risk of stroke, myocardial infarction. Uh, they've been through multiple drug regimes. Uh, we put these people on our system. Uh, it takes about two weeks. What we discover is that about 85% of them are fully responsive to drug therapy. The only little trick is they actually have to take it. Now, um, it may sound a bit like science fiction. It's not. It is science. It's not fiction. Uh, it's actually happening in a really sophisticated location in the UK, well known, well, well known for leading edge technology. It's a place called Whizbeach, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, and these patients are being cared for by really high-end, regular National Health Service doctors. So it's a very simple system, very easy to use, creates really interesting value. What we're doing here is to combine ingestible computing with wearable computing, with mobile computing, with cloud computing, to make a seamless solution that works for you where you live in ways you can see and understand. And we can create and capture just enormous amounts of data. So this is Morris. He's an 84-year-old guy who's uh, living at home. His family wants him to keep living at home, not going to a care home. Uh, so he's struggling with activities of daily life and use of medicines. And so I'm going to sort of describe this very data-rich picture to you. This is nothing that we'd share with him or his family, but you can see the kind of information we're getting. So the colors represent body angle. Blue would be lying flat. Red is fully upright and active. Yellow is sitting down. Kind of green is sort of reclining. All right. Uh, to the right of that picture, you've got his medication-taking behavior. He's on two meds a day. If he was perfectly adherent, you'd have two straight white lines. This is 60 days of data. This guy's been on the system now for over a year. He's been watched by his family, but Morris is a rock star for a guy of 84. He's getting up every morning around 7.45. He's active in the morning. He sits down at lunchtime. He's active in the afternoon. He sits in a barker lounger in the afternoon, watches telly, goes to bed pretty much every night around 10 o'clock, and he's pretty good apart from his morning dose. Pretty interesting data, right? And so this guy is okay, and he's being managed by his family. This, this is Derek. Does anybody need me to explain that? So we know very clearly who needs to see a doctor and who doesn't, right? This is essentially the same patient. Same diagnosis, old guy, wants to stay at home, struggling with activities of daily life, use of medicines. Here's the data. This guy needs help. I'm going to wrap this up by talking about what I think this means for pharma. And this is a topical idea, I think, because I think there's some news about pharma companies right now. Um, so in the last century, global pharma became roughly a trillion dollar industry. And it did it by creating a lot of new products, things. So in 1900, Bayer launched aspirin, and we entered the age of chemistry. The FDA came along in 1938. There were actually about 1,800 um, uh, NDAs in 1939, and then you could see this huge sort of cycle of innovation created by chemistry. There was a bit of a boost in the 1980s because we came up with biology, and you saw in 1982 the first, first, bio, first biologic drug. So we enter the age of chemistry and biology. But today, what we know is that this innovation cycle is flattening. In fact, it's declining, and if you're in the industry, what you're really worried about is it's going to start going down. All these products are becoming generic, and that means they're worth pretty much nothing. Big problem. All right, but we've had a really, really nice innovation run based on things. Now, everybody here knows about the internet, and we're all really excited about the internet. And so, 
Here's something about the internet and healthcare and how it has really created a huge opportunity around information. So Netscape in 1994, Google 1998, by 2001, 62% of everybody in, in, on the internet is searching for healthcare information. Uh, WebMD in 2005, we get healthcare apps. We've got about 33,000 healthcare apps today. That's a lot and lots and lots of potential. What does this mean for pharma? This is the best opportunity in a hundred years for this industry because what I'm describing to you is our ability to combine the internet with things. We are putting the internet on your drugs. There's roughly 15 trillion drugs in the supply chain today. So we have the first ingestible sensor approved by FDA in 2012. We're going to enter an era of chemistry and biology and physics. We can take every single medicine that's ever been approved and turn it into a digital object. It's a whole new pathway for innovation in this industry based on software. So, songs, books, drugs. These are fantastic 20th century libraries that are going to reveal their digital potential in the 21st century. It's a pretty fantastic thing. So, we look at this and say we're right at the beginning of a new cycle in healthcare where we can create a new piece of the industry that's about digital drugs. What we're trying to do is to offer solutions that are designed to work for people where they live, in ways that they can see, measure, and understand, and where people pay only when the product does what they want it to. So, this is a large wave, and there is plenty of room on it for lots of other surfers. So my invitation is, if you're a drug company, you come join us. Thank you. So Andrew, you're, you're kind of showing us, like, not the happy ending, but the happy middle bit of the journey, but it's not been a simple project you've taken on. Just to give us an example, or an idea of the scale of this, how much have you raised in the time you've been with Proteus? Yeah, so look, this is not a simple project. Uh, the FDA component here is very significant. Uh, so we have medical devices that are de novo. That means there's nothing in the category, and we created the category, and then we have new FDA pathway. So the company has raised about $400 million to date, uh, but don't hold your breath because um, we'll be announcing something else later. Um, so, yeah, and we, we would fully expect, if you just sort of spec, spec this, you know, um, a single drug today is roughly four and a half billion. Um, we're about, um, let's say, $500 million in, um, but we have a whole platform. Um, and so you should expect us to be raising in the next few years way over a billion dollars. Wow, that's some startup. And. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Pharma companies protect their products, very strong IP. Yep. Can you protect your methodology in as watertight a way so you can ensure you are the company that scales? Now, I'll mention three patents that I like, or three claims that I like. These are all claims that were issued as first office actions. Anybody here who knows what a first office action is will know that's rather an unusual thing. It means there's no file wrapper. We like that because it's hard to figure out how to get around it. Um, claim number one that I really like is digitizing any drug in FDA's orange book. It's a great claim. Um, second claim I really like, making a computer out of food ingredients. A third claim, it's more recent actually, uh, is um, uh, demodulating a non-physiologic signal from inside the body. That's the medical equivalent of downloading a song. That's a good claim. So, I mean, we have fantastic IP. Uh, we invest in I mean, we have hundreds of filings, 160, 170 issued patents, I mean, probably thousands of claims. How many people work at the company? Uh, about 350. Well, good luck for your next billion. Thank you very much, Andrew <laughs> Thompson. <laughs>